All right. So uh, welcome back to Where the API is with R. Uh, it's been a while, uh, a little over a month, I think now that, since we've met. Um, I uh, made some pretty big changes since we last talked, or I guess I was like getting started on them the last time we met. Um, and hopefully we're on a path to something fairly understandable. Um, so last time I kind of went over uh, some planned uh, changes to uh, the effectively the first chapter, the chapter about just getting started with APIs. And I had cut out a whole section that I had tried to include originally about um, like this package for automatic uh, parsing of nested lists um, and uh, some stuff about this uh, specification and just other things. Those got cut out and put into this chapter. And I think it flows a lot better, makes a lot more sense. So hopefully you will agree. Um, but before that chapter, so I, I had this thought that I think it belongs in either that previous chapter or maybe the introduction, but I put it here because I wanted to kind of go over it. And that is, oh, actually, we're going to do the learning objectives first. That's right. Uh, so the learning objectives of this chapter are to parse nested lists with Tiblify, uh, to use an API's open API description to learn about the API, and to uh, parse API responses with Tiblify and the response description. Um, we'll go over what all those mean, obviously, as we as we walk through. Um, so, but first, we've got this aside about like last chapter, we went through and we rectangled some data, uh, took took these nested lists, and turned them into tibbles. And I didn't really talk about why why do we care and why why do we have to do that. Um, and I think this is kind of fundamental to uh, the difference between anyone reading this book and people who work with APIs in like other ways. <laughs> and so I think it's important to talk about. So apps, um, you know, the broad category of things called apps, they usually think in objects. Um, so like if you, even if you go to Amazon and you're getting a list of results, each one of those results is like a self-contained object that has all of its properties inside of it, it doesn't have, you know, you don't, you almost never have a column of, uh, of, you know, prices even like each thing has the price inside of it. Uh, because, you know, you want that to be formatted and displayed in a certain place within the listing of that, that object. And because of that, uh, the preferred data is like objects. It's, it's collections of things. Um, or not collections, like individual things with properties. And so um, I've got some example, JSON, we had, we had looked at stuff kind of like this, but you know, it's this object and it has an API's guru object inside of it, an fbc.gov object and a Google APIs.com YouTube object. And then you know, we look inside of the APIs.guru object, it has a versions object and inside the versions object is one particular version and there could be more. And then way down here is where you actually get to the properties of that thing. And they're just like nested way down inside of it. And that makes sense for a website or for a game or for like almost any other use of data. Uh, you tend to want to work with one object at a time. Um, but the way that like Again, you know, data scientists, data analysts, anyone working with data uh, is different. Is usually we want to look at a lot of objects at once. We want to compare the date that things were added, or dates that things were updated, or you know, what version of a specification everything uses. Like, what's the average version, uh, the mean or the median, uh, all that kind of thing. So we want to look at it all at once. And so we like to think in data frames or tibbles. Um, and I feel like this is like a fundamental difference of why uh, R is 
kind of weird when it comes to programming languages. Um, because like or data frames existed before R. Uh, they were invented in S. And uh, so when R was created from S, they were there. Um, and things like pandas and polar, polars, those are attempts to make Python think like R just naturally things, because that's what you want when you're working with data, when you're working, you know, looking at everything at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, we have you know columns of variables where the column is all the same class, so it's a date, or it's a character, it's an integer in each column. And then we have rows of observations. Those are effectively like what an object is, but those are like mythical. <laughs> like a row, if you're selecting a row, you're really selecting that same thing in each of the columns, that same number. Uh, APIs tend to be designed for that first one. Uh, even data APIs, like something that is accessing the database, they, they, they think in objects because programmers think in objects and they don't realize that they're making their data API the wrong way. Um, I don't know. I just felt like this was really important. <laughs> like it's the reason that this book is different from a JavaScript book about working with APIs or a, even a Python book about working with APIs because we think differently. We don't have equal spaces. Um, <laughs> um, just, I don't know, does anyone have any uh, thoughts, opinions, questions, comments on that? <clears throat> so the previous chapter and this chapter are basically dealing with this, that APIs are thinking in objects and we don't, we want the whole data, generally. So um, last, last time, last chapter, we had to do a lot of work to make things into the right shape. And I want to talk about this package, Typify, that tries to uh, make it a little bit easier. So to do that first, um, I, I want to you know, go back to what I had that data, that JSON that I, we were just looking at. Um, that is available if you want to play with it. It's in right now. It's in the um, book club uh, folder, but I will put that or an equivalent thing to that into the book itself uh, site at some point. Um, you can get that with like we saw last chapter, JSON Lite from JSON, or there's also um, Read JSON, which is uh, another package or another function from JSON Lite. Just from JSON automatically parses things and tries to figure out whether you're working with a file or a URL or just the JSON itself as a character vector. Um, read JSON doesn't do any of that automatic stuff. It says, oh, it's a file or a URL, and it goes from there. Um, but yeah, so we can read that in and, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> jumped again. That, so that'll give us the data, but that, at that point it is a nested list like we saw before, and it's a big mess to work with. Um, we can, uh, what was I just say? oh, okay, it's just my screen. Um, we can uh, uh, rectangle that with uh, IDR. We walked through how to do this before, but it takes, you know, it's a bunch of separate steps of thinking about, okay, at this point we want to go longer, I don't care about the indices at that point because it's just a num numbered list. But here we want to um, keep them and name it, name a column, and then we want to go wider to get everything spread out. I'm not going to go through that step by step this time because we went through the same, pretty much the same data in the previous chapter. Uh, but it's a little bit of a pain, so it'd be nice if you do that all automatically. And that is the package typify. So. Uh, to, it's a package to auto-convert hierarchical data into tibbles. Um, basically like a supercharged tidyr unnest auto. Um, and as we're going to see, it creates uh, like nested tibbles still, but the nest, the things that are nested are tibbles. So it's not 
uh, lists that you have to do on this uh, wider or longer. It's a tibble, but you can just kind of easily test or nest or unnest out. Um, it also has some experimental functionality for working with APIs. And I thought a lot of this chapter was going to be talking about that. And then I really worked with it. And it is, uh, it's just flat out broken. It's surprising to me that it's still in the package because um, for some things, it just doesn't work. Um, and so we won't be working that, with that yet. Uh, eventually, I really think that functionality should exist in the package. And so hopefully I'm gonna end up making some of it or I'll work with the guy who uh, writes Tiplify because it's, it's not quite there right now. Um, so we're going to go through and see some of the like, what it wants to do um, and come up with some tools about talking to All right, so if we take that same demo JSON and on this typify, we just use this function typify, and we can see that it's got this dot names column. We'll talk about that. Oops. Uh, talk about that. Why? Uh, why it's dot names and how we fix that. And then it. You know, it looks like it's a list column, kind of like what we got within frame, but you can see it's a list of tibbles. And so all of those tibbles are standard shapes, um, which means we can use just tidyr on nest to uh, pull it out into the wider format. We don't have to use a nest longer than a nest wider, all of that. Uh, the one thing I did have to manually do here is rename uh, that original dot names column to get API ID here. And we do still get another dot names column. So we'll pick that up. Not perfect yet, but much cleaner, like much more straightforward. Um, let me um, And so let's look at uh, side by side uh, that manual work versus um, the automatic to apply. Right. So you don't need right. You don't need on this longer or on this wider. It's just on this. They all do everything. Now, um, I do want to warn you. Like the previous chapter still matters because simplify doesn't always work, and so it's good to know how to fix it when simplify doesn't work. Um, but uh, when it does work, it's very nice. It will take care of things. We're going to talk a little bit about how to make it work more often. That's the information that we have. But yeah, it's just so much nicer. And so if we look at it side by side, on the left here, we have that original thing. Uh, I did like wrap these lines out to make them fit into the uh, skinny box, but still, uh, you know, it's relatively long, and each of these steps like takes thought to figure out which one you have to do. Uh, this one, if you did unnest auto, this would not work. It would, it would drop those indices, so uh, it just it's messy. Versus, if we take simplify, much less. It's actually only a couple of lines less, but again, you don't have to think other than the rename steps, uh, and those are just to you know. Make it play nice, uh, make it look nice. Other than that, it just it's all automatic. Um, and just to prove that, there's a package of Waldo it's for finding differences between things it's used in package testing. Um, and so we can compare those two things. Waldo compare, it's listed as map is just saying, I don't care about your columns. And when we do that, it says, okay, yeah, they're the same. So much easier uh, when it works now. It doesn't always work. Um, and part of the reason it doesn't always work is by default, when we're just calling Tiplify, is using this function to spec yes. So um, Tiplify has a spec argument. If you don't supply that spec argument, it is going to use, uh, uh, or, and I realized it's not called inspect guess. I have to fix that because it's not the name thing. It's the other way around. It's guess spec. Um, 
And it's basically that spec argument is what should this look like? You know, what what do you what do I what am I going to do with this? Um, so guess t spec is the actual name of the function, and when we call that on uh, demo JSON, creates or it shows us this um, list of typify commands. So there's t spec df, um, and then it's got names too, and so we can see oh we could have you know if, if it weren't guessing we can tell it what we actually want those names to be. Uh, and then inside of the t-spec, it has this tib uh, calls, which uh, those are like the, the columns of this uh, data frame that we are specifying. And it's saying, take the object that's named versions and turn it into a data frame. Uh, the names inside of versions should go to a new names column. And then it has all these uh, character columns to care. Um, and then it tells you know, the arguments to each of these named arguments, those are what is the object called in the thing that we're reading? Um, and by default, it's just going to leave those or keep those same names. Um, something that you might kind of notice is this added and updated. Those actually aren't like their, their character originally, but we would like them to be eight times. Um, so it'd be nice if we could change this automatic thing and maybe say, hey, treat those as eight times. Um, but it does a pretty good job. It would be really nice if we just had some of the API would say, tell us what should we do to format this problem. That leads us to the open API specification. So originally, this chapter was going to be all about this specification. Um, we're going to introduce it here. We're going to keep coming back to this throughout the book because it's huge. And um, it is a way of describing everything that there is about an API. So I'm not going to get all of it. Um, before we dive into it, I do want to say there are multiple standards. Um, the one you'll most likely hear about in circles where you hear about API specification standards. Um, is Swagger. Uh, Swagger 2.0 is OpenAPI 2.0. So Swagger was created by this, uh, there's a website, wordnick.com. It's a free online dictionary that compiles a bunch of sources from different APIs. And just a developer there is working with all these different APIs and was annoyed that they all had their own ways of describing things. So he created this standard. And then Oh, sorry, that became a uh, open source project and uh, like spread and was used quite a bit. And so eventually the separate company bought the Swagger specification from the company that owned Wordnik and the tools that they had developed. Um, and now technically Swagger is the tools and OpenAPI is the standard specification. Um, the company that bought it officially created a uh, like nonprofit group a, uh, to, I think it's part of the Linux Foundation, uh, to administer this specification. So it's officially open forever. Um, currently, OpenAPI 3.1 is technically the, the current version. And throughout this book, I'm going to be talking about OpenAPI 3.0 slash 3.1. Um, technically, OpenAPI 4 is in development, and then there are these other versions, other specifications. There's Postman Collection, um, API Blueprints, Web Application Description Language, or Waddle. Those are out there too, but there are tools to convert any of them to OpenAPI 3. Um, eventually, we might talk about those tools, or we might not, because often you can just find OpenAPI 2. So, Technically, as we go through, when I'm talking about this is the standard, it's this particular piece of the standard. Uh, because, uh, you know, I should have put the obligatory XKCD here that there are uh, many standards out there, but OpenAPI is like the, the one that covers all of the pieces. You can take any of these and convert them to OpenAPI. You can't necessarily convert OpenAPI to, to all of these because they're missing pieces. Uh, they only deal with the pieces that they care about. Um, but yeah, we're going to dive into that a little bit. And I have this other 
slide that's a little bit out of place right now. Uh, but the other thing we need to know when we are dealing with open API uh, descriptions of, of APIs is YAML. So YAML is another format like JSON. It is technically a superset of JSON. So any JSON, you could just change the file name to .yaml and it would be a standard uh, proper YAML at that point. Um, it originally meant yet another markup language, but it started to get used, like it's really handy for data specifically. And so it's not really used for markup anymore. So kind of semi-officially, it now means YAML ain't markup language. Um, but just to compare it, we've got JSON here on the left. You know, we can read that with read JSON or from JSON. And this is like the top of an open API specification uh, for the APIs.guru API. Um, and, you know, this is made to be read by computers. Uh, and so it's got these nested um, uh, brackets and different brackets mean different things. And you have quotes around all of the strings. And, you know, I, I formatted it nice, but often there won't be any spacing within uh, JSON versus this is the same thing in YAML. You can use the package YAML function read YAML. Um, and that is that same data in YAML. Uh, and so, you know, we drop all of the quotation marks. We, um, and yes, there are JSON formatters that can make it uh, much easier to work with JSON, but YAML is still like, it's just, it's meant to be read by humans and edited by humans. And therefore it's a lot easier to work with a lot of times, especially if you just want to like change one thing. Um, you can kind of see the nested list format in it. Like it's got this nesting going on. Um, it has comments and you can't have comments inside of JSON data. So that was uh, another addition, um, but it can, and actually at one, in one version of this, I showed like you could have just, you know, like we could have these as um, in, in the square brackets uh, inside of that. Still, we could have that inside of the YAML because YAML includes JSON. So you can put JSON anywhere in YAML and it's um, still proper YAML. Um, so yeah, all JSON strings are valid YAML, but not all YAML is valid JSON. Uh, the file extensions you'll see are .yaml, Y-A-M-L, or .yml. Um, and you might have seen this before. It's in um, R Markdown and Quarto headers and configuration files, uh, package configuration files, so like package down uh, .yml or codecove.yml. Um, GitHub Actions, if you've worked with GitHub Actions, those are in YAML. And um, the like description format for packages is uh, a cousin of YAML. It's technically a different format, but it's it has the same ideas going on where the indentation matters. Everything's like colons and then indentation. Um, so much easier to work with. I just wanted to bring that up because we're going to be seeing um, a lot of times we're going to look at things in YAML format because it's easier to read that same data. All right, so um, let's dig into uh, at least a little bit of an API specification. Um, we can hop over here and just see, this is the open API specification for APIs.guru. I can't remember um, if we've all seen this before, but uh, this will be the first time I bring it up in uh, the current version of the book. It's got all these like sections of things about the API. We've got like, where can you find the API? Oh, I guess starting off, what version of the specification does this use? So this happens to use version 3.0.0. What are the servers? Um, what are some information about it, uh, et cetera? And I'm not gonna scroll all the way through because I have in the slide, just the overhead or quick, quick overview, the open API piece, that's the, the like, what version of the spec is this? And then if we are looking at API, open API version three or higher, uh, we'll see things like info, servers, tags, external docs, um, just like a lot of like metadata about the API. Uh, security is like a list of named default security schemas. So those are the ones that 
any endpoint um, will be expecting if it's not otherwise specified. Um, there's a paths section, and that is like all the things that uh, when I say endpoints, that means like functions of the of the API, the things the API can do. Uh, there's these three webhooks, JSON, schema, dialect, or X, whatever. Uh, we're not going to talk about those. Uh, those are, do exist, but they're both rare and um, not something we need to care about. And, but there's also components. And components is kind of the secret sauce of the API specification because it's this place where you can put things that you're going to reuse, like uh, security schemes, uh, different security schemes of how to access it, or maybe different parameters that a bunch of different endpoints use the same parameters, or uh, responses. So if you want to describe how a response is going to be coming back and what shape you should expect from that. That is also in this uh, components, specifically in the schema section, generally. Um, and so those schemas um, are, are you know, going to be really handy. Let's take a look at those. So uh, for the rest of this chapter, we're going to basically dig into this schemas section from apis.guru to kind of understand how these things work and start to see how we could use those to uh, like fill out uh, the thing for Tiplify. Like if you get something back from Tiplify or if you're going to be working with an API a lot, you can use these schemas to uh, build one of those T-specs and really um, not have to worry about is the auto processing going to get it right. So let's start with um, this APIs schema. So uh, you know this is inside of the components thing in that spec, and it's it, within components. There's a schemas section, and in schemas we have APIs. Um, different endpoints will say this is going to use the APIs schema, and it'll just say that. And then you have to, you know, you can look here and see what does that mean. Um, this will tell us like a description. It's going to give, give us a list of API details. It's a JSON object with API, ID, API IDs um, in this format as the keys. And so it's telling us, oh, it's going to be a list. That's good to know. That That's handy. Uh, and that there, it's a named list. OK, that's cool. Um, it's an object. Uh, we'll see some things that are not, that are different types, but uh, object just meaning, you know, it's that larger container. Um, it's telling us that there's at least one property, um, one thing that will be coming back from it. When it shows this min properties, that's saying it's, it's something list like, and it could be one thing or it could be a thousand things. Um, and so that's handy information. And then it just kind of throws us this, you know, dollar sign ref, and you'll see these throughout different schemas. Um, that it is, it's saying, "Hey, go look in this other place, this API. That's what I contain. I contain these individual API schema objects." Um, by the way, I simplified this very slightly from all of these, very slightly from the full open API schema because I want it to be something we can work with. Um, the APIs level, I don't think I actually changed anything at all, but the, the other ones have some higher level things. So um, we can take this thing and what it says and say, okay, I'm going to make a T-spec for APIs. And it's going to use Tiblify that T-spec DF because I'm, it, you know, it said, or I want to make a data frame out of it. It told me I've got some names coming in and that they are the uh, API IDs. And so I'll turn those names into API IDs. And then it says that I'm going to reference this other schema. And so anytime you're going to reference another schema, you can throw in another T-spec. And so we'll see how to build that T-spec in a second. But being able to read these things, we can just set these things up and we'll see at the very end, then everything just reads in nice and clean and perfect and beautiful. Um, all right. And what? Yeah, okay. Wanted to make sure that I uh, covered all of my notes here. So we had 
a reference to the API schema. Let's take a look at that. So um, again, it's in component schemas and it's named API. Uh, it is meta information about an API. It's another object. Um, it doesn't have any uh, additional properties. So it's not reading just a whole set of properties from some other schema. Um, it's telling us that there's one required property that is versions, and then it gives us a list of properties. And so here, the required that required property is uh, versions, which is itself an object, um, which is a list of supported versions of the API. So each API contains this object that is a list that again has min properties one. So that tells us that it's a uh, list like, and it itself is going to be reading from yet another spec. And so that's kind of how all these things, the specs, like especially the really well-structured ones will be these nested uh, specs. And the nested specs, like that makes sense because we're getting back this big nested list. And so it's going to be a nested spec and we can just like think in each of those pieces as we're, we're getting ready to read the data in. Um, if we again look at that whole thing and try to make a T spec, um, ooh, I almost ran out of room. So here we're not. Um, each of these APIs is is one element for the the top level thing, and so in that case we're using T spec row. So we're saying it's just one one thing. It's one piece of the return, one API. Um, th sorry, the op I didn't really go over these here, but in Tibble or Tiblify, you can, your types of T-specs are a DF, meaning it's going to be a whole data frame. T-spec row just means that's a like one row data frame. And then there's T-spec um, object, I think, which is a list. Uh, we're never going to work with that because we always want to try to make things nice and rectangular and perfect. And so data frame, T-spec DF, T-spec row. And inside of this row, we have this versions object. So the versions is going to be a tibble, a, a data frame. Um, it tells us that it has, a, or it's a list of supported versions um, and that there will be at least one of them. The names two piece, um, you're always gonna have to do a little bit of experimentation because it's not clear that this is gonna be named. And that part kind of annoys me um, and I haven't found a good answer for that yet, but um, <laughs> You just kind of have to experiment and see, oh yeah, we wanted this thing to be named. Uh, each one is a version. Uh, I think actually if you said names two and it didn't have names, it would just give a numbered column. So it never hurts. And so we could say, oh, it's it's the versions object and we're gonna call each one of them a version. And actually that totally makes sense. So we knew that. And then finally, the only element of this tibble is uh, this API version because it's we see that it contains that. Is this? kind of making sense at all making sense how's everyone feeling at this point i like i said i have i've rewritten this slide deck like 14 times but i want to get us to where we're able to do these um because then any api you're working with you can just go to these things once you've done it a couple of times you just can pull in the spec and be ready to grab your data and it'll just rectangle it cleanly so um, okay. All right. And then, so the final one, uh, is the big one that this is the API version schema schema. Um, so API version is the name, uh, again, it is an object and it is, doesn't have any additional properties, um, but it has, uh, a whole bunch of required properties. Uh, we're going to see that all of all but one of the properties that we include in here are required. And then each one of those properties um, each one and just to clarify, Gabby, I don't like I don't think most data scientists know anything about APIs either. So <laughs> don't feel like it's that you don't know because you're not a data scientist. Um, it's that you don't know because you don't develop applications. Um, and that's why I'm making this book is uh, it's something that you often have to work with, but a, I don't think a lot of data scientists 
know how to. <laughs> um, okay, and we'll see you later, Kevin. All right, and so that yeah, the properties of these API versions, um, it has all these things: added, link, open API for, etc. But if we look at each of them, you know, it's they each have a description. Um, they sometimes have a format like date, time, or URL, and then the type is string, which is like programmer speak for uh, character vector, but length one. Uh, so um, it's telling us what, what these things should look like. Um, most of these do have this format URL, and I'm not going to actually specifically go into that in the spec that we work on, uh, but some of them are date time. And so it would be nice if we could just kind of auto format those. So something that I had to include in here right now, and um, I hope to just uh, do a pull request into Tiblify so that we don't need to go over this, is that they don't have a date time format built into Tiblify. They have a date format, but they don't have date time, but we can build one. And so Tiblify has this uh, function tib scalar that you can use to like build your own uh, typify types or column types basically. I'm not going to go into all the details of how that works. You can copy paste this if you need to work with a, uh, a, a date time column. Uh, but this will just it'll take that thing that is a date time and turn it into an actual date time object that you can then compare in R and you can you know add a, extract just the day or just the hour or whatever you need out of that data. All right, um, so armed with that, now we can make this T-Spec API version um, thing, which again, it's a T-Spec row because it's just one ver version, one row of the data. Um, we use that TIB character date time uh, function for the added and updated because if we go uh, back here, added is format date time and updated is format date time. And so we're gonna use that. We aren't making any special thing for this URL yet, although typically we probably should if we wanted to be really good about it. Um, but for each of those, we're just gonna use character. Um, and then the the other weird one is that link is the only, not, uh, only column that's not actually required if we looked at that list of required things. And so that one uh, by default, uh, to Tiblify just assumes everything's required unless you tell it it's not. Um, given the spec, it's the opposite, but whatever. <laughs> we have to work with what we have to work with. So now we've got all of those T specs all the way up, and we can take, uh, you know, let's start with one specific version. So if we go down into that JSON object and just pull out one version and Tiblify it using T spec API version. Voila, it makes the data with like formats the columns as date times. Um, it, uh, you know, that's pretty much all. It didn't do anything that amazing there, but it did it all, um, you know, automatically using the data that we got from the spec. Um, or we can look at just one API. So if we take just the APIs.guru API and use our T-Spec API, and I, I went ahead and unnested automatically, and we could see that we got, you know, we have a version column in there. It's not called .name, it's called version now. And that the added and updated are formatted as date times. Or if we take the whole thing and use T-Spec APIs and unnest that, again, we get API ID, we don't have to rename that column. We get version, and then we get our formatted columns. Um, I think that, yeah. So that is the abrupt ending of this slide deck right now. <laughs> um, I feel like I'd want to put some kind of wrap up stuff in here, but uh, didn't quite get there. But yeah, so I know that this feels, I don't know, I hope it felt useful because um, a lot of APIs that you will work with have these specifications that tell you all the details um, about uh, open API or about the API. Um, and so, you know, you can use those details 
to kind of build these these parsers. And then once you have them built, um, unless the the spec is lying to you, which on some occasions it will be, but most of the time it's not. And so unless it's lying to you, you'll you just have a thing that can auto parse whatever response they send back to you. Um, even if you know if you try to do it just automatically, it might be that all the times before you uh, like the added was blank. And so the auto parser thought that it was um, just logical because it, it, you know, NA's default to logical. And then you get a date time and it wouldn't know what to do with it. But if you build your parsers, uh, that data is ready and you don't have to be surprised. You know, really useful if you're building data pipelines. Um, you don't have to worry about it breaking one of the times that it comes back because you're telling it what to expect. Um, yeah. All right. And I will um, grab that link, Jim, to see. Does that sound? Um, I mean, I <laughs> I am on the the Open API Slack, and uh, like I'm deep in the weeds with Open API these days. Um, but yeah, there are uh, a lot of things to learn about it for sure. And like I said, we're going to keep coming back to it because this was just one little piece of the spec. Um, another very useful piece that we'll be looking at, uh, I'm not sure if it's the next chapter or the chapter after that at this point, but um, all the different paths, the different things that you can do with the API are also in that spec. And that's where Tiblify does have some functionality that works. Um, and it works pretty well, where it will take that whole section of the specification and make a tibble for you on that, so you can use that to search for different things within the, the API, which can be yeah. All right, any other comments, questions? Um, I think then that I am going to uh, hop off in just a sec. Uh, to see what my dogs are barking at. But, um, my goal next week is to go on to uh, the following chapter. And so the next chapter is going to be one that I already did. It's going to be the one that introduces Hitter 2, but it'll be in a totally different shape now because we've done a lot of buildup to it. Um, and so I'm I don't know if I'm going to like go through that whole chapter or if I'll end up doing like that chapter in part of the next one or what I'll do, but I'll have something. Um, and I would, you know, if there is something in particular that you, any questions that you have or things you would like to see, definitely let me know in the Slack. Um, yeah, so yes, <laughs> that learn open API. So the openapi.org openapis.org, excuse me, is the Open API initiative. Um, and I would say, like, if you really want to, uh, it wouldn't hurt to go use that, that uh, the link that uh, Jim put in the chat, but that is aimed at developers. It's going to be in that frame of mind where you think in objects and, oh, it just makes sense to think in objects. and at least to me, I really think that's a big part of why some of these guides don't make sense to me. Is I don't think like that. I think in data. I don't think in objects. Um, and so some of these things, I don't know. I don't think that they will be super clear sometimes. But you know, if you want to go learn more about the spec, for sure, the spec itself, like it is what it is. And so it's not going to be too bad. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to learn there, for sure. And a lot of stuff that we don't need to know yet. Um, I think unless you are actively working with an API, which you may be if you're watching this video. Uh, but yes, learn.openapis.org slash specification is also useful. Um, yeah. <laughs> Only we could. And just get the new things uploaded into our brains. Um, yeah, but there are like... Uh, <laughs> There are um, and they all come in objects. And, and often I am trying to get like, you know, a thousand rows more of them and have to go through and parts everything. And just being able to take that thing and automatically turn it into a tibble is very good. So, 
All right. I will see everybody on Slack. Okay. I guess not.